All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Glenn Arnold. I work in Ohio. I work with Livestock Menard. I have enjoyed the conference quite a bit, but uh, got to admit that a lot of it's more complicated than what we're trying to do in Ohio. So uh, we're going to try to keep what we do with our manure relatively simple in comparison. We have Lake Erie to our north. That's our uh, driving force on uh, trying to do a better job with our livestock manure. If any of you follow, if you can lower the lights at all. I'm going to do it. I know it right here. Great. If any of you have followed uh, a couple summers ago, Toledo had to shut uh, their water intake system down for uh, 52 hours. It garnered a lot of national uh, attention, garnered a lot of humor on behalf of the evening uh, um, talk show hosts and stuff. There you go. That's better. That's better. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, uh, a lot of concerns. When you look at our Lake Erie, the thought process back in the 60s when they, were tra they started tracking phosphorus, um, Heidelberg College up our way, there's a lot of water quality information. The thought process was if we could get the phosphorus going into Lake Erie down to 11,000 metric tons per year, that the lake would clean up, the wildlife fishing would come back, and everybody would be happy. It's about a $10 billion industry. Uh, it's a big deal in, in uh, that area. And generally, you would have thought we would be pretty satisfied with our results. But in the last, uh, since about 1993, uh, this is the entire watershed that we had compassed. Of Ohio's 80, 88 counties, 24 touch parts of the Lake Erie watershed. <coughs> and then Grand Lake St. Mary's is a very shallow 20,000 acre lake right here. It's kind of been our poster child for phosphorus problems. Very, very shallow, three feet depth. Uh, a lot of large livestock, the biggest livestock concentration in Ohio is right through this area right here. Regardless of that, if you look at our little, if you look at all the watersheds that go into Lake Erie and other places in Ohio, they all are showing a trend. And that is that this is dissolved phosphorus Starting in about 1993, you see how all of these lines go upward. In the state of Ohio, we have a lot more dissolved phosphorus leaving farm fields today than we did 25 or 30 years ago. We buy less phosphorus, we apply less phosphorus, <coughs> but we have more leaving. We think there's two possible explanations. We have a lot of research going on, hopefully we'll figure it out. One theory is the lack of acid rain a lack of uh, sulfide to tie up phosphorus in our soil. And almost all the soil tests that come back now from labs call for sulfur in our area. So it might be just a consequence of doing a better job on the acid rain. The second possibility, and the one that I'm kind of in, a, in a pushing pretty hard right now, is our stratification of phosphorus. Uh, as we've got away from the plow and we do our chisel till and our no till and our other conservation tillage, we put almost all of our phosphorus out in October uh, following our bean crop and leave it on top of the soil surface rather than in July following wheat crop and uh, plowing it under or, or tillage of some sort. So uh, regardless, livestock agriculture is uh, taking a lot of the brunt in our, in our watershed simply because every bit, a lot of people have in their head, especially the media, that it's got to be livestock. So just to clarify, our dairy manure primarily we store in outdoor lagoons or outdoor ponds. We empty these things, so we don't treat them as a true lagoon. And that'd be different from other parts of the state. Our, our hogs primarily are, are in these double white hog buildings with an eight foot pit underneath of it. This is generally how our hog manure is stored. It's underground, we keep our nitrogen, we're able to work with that. When I talk to farmers, they tell me that roughly half of our manure in Ohio was put out in the fall following harvest time. Roughly half. And again, it varies a little bit. When you get to the eastern part of the state, they do a little more in this April to June time period. But when you get on the western part of the state, where we're primarily corn and soybeans with some wheat <coughs> rotation, everything goes on after harvest starts in the fall. We've got about a billion gallons of swine manure and about two and a half billion gallons of dairy wastewater and manure that we have to handle every year. Uh, our windows are dictated by our growing crops. Wheat acreage continues to decline and our season starts in the fall. The problem is that when we get a delay in our fall manure window, anything that delays harvest delays manure application. 
Anything that delays manure application gets us into the winter months. It's not unusual. People put manure out on the snow and then you get a warm trend and then what happens? They're doing everything they can to keep that stuff on the field. And, and again, they're in violation, they're gonna get written up. Everybody gets a black eye. It's just an issue that we deal with. We, I feel we need to work at a new window of manure application in the state. The other thing we give away when we do all this fall manure application is we give away nitrogen. When we send our manure tests into the state, labs, and, and get work done, they come back with a total nitrogen number. Let's just pick this swine finisher here at 43. Yeah, of that 43, most of that is in the ammonium form, readily available to a crop. A little bit of it is in the organic form. We have what we call manure available nitrogen that would be available to the crop the first year. In this example, there's 40 pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 gallons that would be available to a corn crop. Dairy is quite a bit less. But we can enhance that. We've figured out ways that we can add liquid nitrogen to dairy manure to bring up the nitrogen value. We started a number of years ago with wheat crops, and I'm talking going back more than 15, maybe almost 20 years ago now, where we used a tanker and we did incorporation, we did surface application, and we compared that to urea on wheat just to find out how the, the crop would respond. Over the three years that we tracked it closely, the yellow bar, this is 2007, 8, 2009, the yellow bar was the surface applied swine manure, the red bar was the incorporated swine manure, the gray bar was the urea. About 100 to 105 units of nitrogen per acre each year was used. It shows several things. One, the manure held its own all three years. We're pretty happy about that. It shows the wheat has got great variability from year to year and that's why people are taking it out of the rotation. You can have a great year, then you can bounce back with a miserable year, and then you didn't do anything different in the process, just the way Mother Nature treats you. But it showed us there was great potential. As a result of that, we commonly apply manure in Ohio to wheat in the spring, uh, using a dryer because we want to get away from the soil compaction, we want to get to the, effic the efficiencies that we can gather. Some of you would use a some people use the term umbilical cord with this design. Basically, it's what we call a drag hose. This is a six inch hose delivering about 1,200 um, gallons per minute uh, to the applicator. And you can pump this up to about three and a half miles. Put a couple of loose pumps in the system. You can see how flat we are at Northwest Ohio with an advantage for us to use these drag hose systems to move, uh, move the north. Plus, our soils are pretty heavy clay. So you have to be selective. This is always something that we do about the 1st of April in our area of, of Ohio, that we can top dress wheat and we use manure. Now I personally would like to see it uh, incorporated. And when we incorporate on uh, wheat, we basically just had a narrow culture every seven and a half inches that just over the slice of the wheat field and the manure was applied to the top of the slice. It can be done either way, but again, they want something efficient, fast, and this is what we've gone to with our mineral wheat. Now, if we want to compare that with the droppage in the wheat acreage, the fact that wheat doesn't need near the nitrogen that corn does, we want to move to corn. And this is another example. Any window that we can find to put manure on, we're trying to use. This farmer put out a wheat field last fall. He then went out and surface applied manure on top of the newly planted wheat field. And you can see where that big commercial guy turned on the ends. You can see what a, you know, the, the wheat responded nicely to the additional fertilizer. Again, looking for windows to get away from that fall application of manure. We've done a lot of work <coughs> with manure on corn in the last 10 years. And this is our small plot data. And I just want to point out a few things to you. The top half of, of this chart is pre-emergent manure application and um, 28 application, 28 UN application to corn. I did pre-emergent plots because I thought we could drag hose manure on corn before it came out of the ground. I did not think we could do post-emergent manure application with the drag hose. But we did these plots for a number of years. If you look, we've had about three droughts out of the five years on here, but just for example, 28 UAN 
over a five year average, average about 143 bushel per acre. If you look at the post emergent, when the corn was at the B3 stage, we're pretty similar, about two bushel higher, which would be expected. You put the manure, the uh, nitrogen closer to when the crop's gonna use it. But if you compare that to incorporated swine manure, there was quite a jump in yield. Come down here, incorporated swine manure compared to our 28. Quite a jump as well, almost 20 bushel in some examples. If you look at surface applied swine manure where we lose our nitrogen, well, it's quite a bit less than the 28 and a bunch less than the incorporated manure. We can come down here and do the same thing. Incorporated dairy, or excuse me, incorporated swine versus surface applied. Now we also did it with dairy manure, but dairy doesn't pack the nitrogen. So to make the dairy numbers work out, every treatment got 200 units of nitrogen. So for the swine manure, these, the, the amount was 5,000 gallons per acre. For the dairy manure, I put on the legal amount, a half inch, 13,577 gallons per acre. But I also added 28% because all I could get was 145 units of nitrogen from the dairy manure. So the rest, I, I put 28% on right ahead of the manure application. But you can still see dairy manure incorporated, swine manure incorporated. Dairy manure incorporated, swine manure incorporated. It really works well. There's a bit of a tillage effect probably, but I think the fact that we place liquid underground, we cover it up, really is uh, paid handsomely. We use this to base where we want to go with our manure research in the future. This is what we've done for a number of years. I uh, have a manure tanker that we have uh, modified. We've gone up and down in Western Ohio. And we've done replicated plots of farmers on their property. And essentially, we'll do 12 rows of manure, they'll do 12 of 28, 12 of manure, 12 of 28. Or if they do, they can't hide some money, we'll keep it back. And all we do is show them the potential of their manure into the little plier on the growing corn crop, incorporate that. And they all say, well, you know, that's really neat, but it's pretty slow. I'm really worried about soil compaction. So we probably aren't going to do this. And I don't have any objection to that. I agree on all those points. But it does stu stir up the farmers and get them thinking. And that's all you do. You just want them thinking because you know that they'll stew on this because they're set on a, a chunk of change in their their pits if they can figure out ways to use it. When I do my plots, I've been incorporating with these Dietrich sweeps. You can see our depth is running around about five inches or so. It's kind of designed partially to take out the uh, soil compaction at the same time that we're doing the manure application. These are some of the plots that we've done up and down Western Ohio. Rare that manure doesn't hold its own against commercial fertilizer. And when you do the economics, it does even better. It's, the opportunity is there. Now with all these guys and all the tanking plots we've done, our goal is to get to get to a drag hose design. This past summer, in addition to our swine plots, we also did li liquid beef manure plots for the first time. I had never done anything with liquid beef manure. It's a little bit thicker than swine manure. I had to gear down a little bit, but the nitrogen is there to do the side dress with, but probably more phosphorus than we really need in our side dress effort. But again, Nofsinger, was there much difference there or not? Sin there was primarily from a soil compaction point of view, but Refinoff's plot, Huffman's plot, statistically they were all about break even. And again, use of beef manure as a side dress product to nitrogen. In addition to beef, this year we also did dairy manure for the first time. Um, we only did a few plots. Remember I said dairy manure was lower in nitrogen than our hog manure is. But again, if you didn't get any rain, you didn't make any difference. So here we are in the 140s there. Here we are in the 220s. Here we are again in the 140s where it didn't provide as well. But it did give us the info that we wanted that the plot results are similar to swine manure and stuff. And the way we added our 28, this is the tanker that we did our application with. You can see we have uh, payloader tires on this tanker. So it can follow the tracker down through the corn rows when we do our plots. 
Essentially, this is a 5,250 gallon tanker. So if I roughly applied 5,000 gallons down and back in a quarter mile field, and roughly, when you take the end rows off and you count the width, that's about eight tenths of an acre. So 5,000 gallons applied, eight tenths of an acre covered, that's a 6,000 gallon per acre rate. If I counted on 10 pounds of nitrogen per each thousand gallons of dairy manure, that means I put on 60 pounds of nitrogen with the dairy manure, 60 pounds per acre. If the farmer wanted 150 as a side dress, then we needed another 90. And we simply put 30 gallons of 28% in at the same time we were loading with our dairy manure and got the mixture we wanted. If the farmer needed 180 pounds, we could just ramp up our 28 application. It works really smooth. We could put, we could eject this into a line that's coming directly from a pit. We could put this in semi tanks that are fracking uh, manure out to a field. Uh, there's lots of ways that we could add this 28 to make it work out for us. We have some guys that do their manure application on corn this way. Now I don't promote this, but I'm starting to realize now after a couple years, this is kind of a baby step in the right direction of where we want to go. This is a person who planted the corn, didn't plant it with just a grain of the crop. So he's going to put his stuff to help me out with the corn there and also acre on his emergent corn. And believe it or not, it actually works pretty good. That's the first corn. He does not do it the way we, we encourage him. He's disposing of the manure on the corn, not reducing his nitrogen side dress and allowing the uh, the manure to grow the corn for him, but it's at least it's a baby step in the right direction. We have a lot of guys in, in Ohio in the last three or four years that have planted their corn fields and then covered them with the manure and had very, very good results with that. So at least they're a step in the right direction. Where we really want to go is this. This is our holy grail. This is what we stroke strive for this is a livestock producer that side dresses the corn that we farm the manure every year, about three years of the past. He simply has a VIP unit here where he incorporates the manure into the emergent corn using the same. He's able to go at uh, 1,200 gallons a minute, if you would, the first one, K to 1. He's able to side dress the corn. The only other nitrogen the cornfield gets is 10 pounds of 28 as starter, which provides 30 units of starter nitrogen. Everything else is side dressed. This is Tom Herod in Dark County. Uh, he was at a meeting year, one time years ago. We talked about this, and he said he was going to give it a try. I'll give you another video of him on a return trip. He's hauling his county extension agent in the red shirt. Again, this is our ideal situation. We are using livestock in a way that will really maximize the nutrients and minimize the loss of nutrients. Last year, he did about 1.1 million gallons in a day. Uh, basically, at four finishing buildings. We talked about each of the four, or the ones that go near there. The commercial applicator came in, set up the hoses the day before, and he was able to make it all go and you can drag right across the corn like that. It wasn't an ideal field because it was wetter than we wanted. We didn't get quite get the incorporation. But if you could walk in there two hours later, you could walk across that field relatively uh, free of getting manure on your, on your uh, shoes. This is a video of harvest. We do this, uh, he allows us to ride with him each year. Year, um, we, we lost 
a lot of our nitrogen from our commercial fertilizer, we think, but the fact that the ammonium nitrogen in the uh, manure is on a positive um, charge, we think we held on to our ammonium nitrogen in our livestock manure better than the commercial fertilizer held on to its nitrogen. And then in 2016, which is a pretty good growing season for it, again, we held our own. So over a three-year average, we're about 13 bushel better on the incorporated manure than we are on the 28. That's really close to the 16 bushel average of my small plots that I've been doing the work on for five years. We really think we've got a good idea here. And the farmers that have witnessed it are pretty excited about it. The other thing that's really important for legislators and lawmakers and environmental people to, to know on the Herod farm, here's how we do the math. Let's assume for a minute that we're going to have a 200 bushel corn crop and a 60 bushel uh, soybean crop, and he's going to go with a corn soybean rotation. If you look at how this balances out, the 200 bushel corn crop, if a corn takes off 0.37 pounds of P2O5 per, eight per bushel, that removes 74 pounds of P2O5. If the uh, corn crop takes off 0.27 pounds of K2O per bushel, then that 200 bu bushel corn crop takes out 54 pounds of K2O. Then the following year, when we do the beans, beans are 0.8 and 1.4 respectively in our area. That means that we take out another 48 pounds of P2O5 and 84 pounds of K2O. So the two year crop removal for the field is 122 pounds of P2O5 and 138 pounds of K2O. <coughs> when when Herod's come in there and they side dress their corn every other year, they're putting on, in addition to the, life, to the nitrogen that we added, they're adding 117 pounds of P205 and 143 of K2O based on their, on their manure tests. So our net gain is virtually break even. With the soil buffering capacity, you have to add or subtract 20 pounds of P205 to change your soil test one. K2O, we have to add or subtract in our area of the country about 12 or 14 pounds of uh, K2O to move our soil test one. So Tom can side dress that field of corn every other year with manure, have a net zero on P2O5 and K2O, and literally raise corn without any additional fertilizer except his starter nitrogen that he's putting on. So, we think we have a sustainable, closed system that will work for all producers who are, have the uh, plant availability and have the means to do this. And so I put down it's almost a perfect ration rotation for corn soybean, almost a perfect fertilizer for us. The challenge is right now, Tom Herod plants his fields at a 45 degree angle. And why would he do that? Has anyone here worked with the drag hose systems or the umbilical cord systems? If you're, a, if you're a commercial drag hose person in Ohio, if you want to put manure on a field, you would lay that hose, caddy corner like this, and then you would proceed to turn on the hose and you would proceed to do the whole half of the field with each pull getting shorter. Then when you got this side done, you'd swing around and then you'd do the other half of the field with each pull getting successively shorter. To make it work out for the drag hose people, they need to be sure that their hose doesn't get twisted and kinked. They need to be sure that they can continue to run. Herons don't mind because they have a 16 row planter. They have automatic shutoffs on the corn seed. So it's not the big <coughs> deal to them to plant a field uh, to accommodate the drag hose. Plus when they save the 75 bucks of nitrogen per acre that they would have bought, they don't think it's a big deal. Then when they spray the field, they just ignore the corn and they just spray the field straight and the corn's small. Could we do it like this? Could we make a drag hose work on a straight field of corn? We don't know, but the commercial drag hose industry in the state of Ohio basically is unemployed from about May 1st to July 1st every year. Because as soon as we can plant corn, they're, they're escorted out of the fields and as soon as wheat harvest starts, then they're back into the fields applying poop. 
the commercial guys see that time period between May 1st and July 1st as money. If they can make the drag hoses work on straight planted cornrows, they think that we can make this be more successful. That's why I carry this uh, chain with me all the time because every time I sit with a commercial manure applicator and have a beer, um, we talk about whether we can make this work and they have, a, they have dollar signs in their eyes, they will figure this out. There's never been a need to do it before, but they will now. We don't use a lot of hose humpers in Ohio. That's just a, a, a system to help move hoses around. I see it in Iowa a lot, other, other states a lot. We do a little bit of it, but not a lot. I think now that we've got an incentive to do it, I think we'll, we'll work more with this type of technology. Some comments that I had, just jotted down when, I, when we use the drag hoses. We've gotten into bad situations with them. Um, it works best in no-till and stale seed beds, firm seed beds. If you get those soft hoses, those drag hoses into a, a spring-worked, deep-tilled field, uh, you will scour dirt when that hose comes around. You will scour dirt. You will sh it's like a road grader. You will shave off dirt. And if you've got, if it's cut an inch and a half into the soil, you might very well take out your corn plants. So you need to, in my opinion, we need to be careful about what seed beds we use them around. But firm ones work really best. Spring, spring work ground can be too loose. We're thinking, we're thinking that when we when we run with our toolbars, we may not put manure on the center row of the uh, corn that we're doing our manure application to, so that that hose will ride higher in the soil, and then we'll run one and a half to each side of that just like a 28 applicator runs one and a half to the outer rows. We may run one and a half times the manure to the two rows on, the, on, on either side of dead center and not run that hose to the center. We're still playing with different ideas. Uh, we think we can reduce the stand a little bit when it's too wet. We did that one year. We knocked off about three, 4,000. But the yield was there, but still we didn't want to knock off corn. It worked so hard to get it there. We think right now it works best in the B2 to B3 stage of growth when the corn's out of the ground. But with the GPS and the auto steer, we ought to be able to do this from the day the corn's planted. As long as the field's firm so that we don't scour and bury the, the newly planted corn seeds, who wouldn't want you know, a quarter inch of moisture added to a field the day after planting? It's a, it's a positive. That. This is some of the commercial applicators. You can see we've got my chain here on the table and we're playing around with it the other day. Uh, we have an annual meeting with our commercial applicators. We introduce the idea to them. Uh, again, a lot of brain power, and uh, they were up to like 30 of us at one time working on this. But again, trying to figure out the best ways to make that hose work out. The other question that comes to mind is how tall can the corn be? So to answer that, every year I have small research plots that we drag. We basically have a hose that we fill with water, and we drag it twice across the corn. We drag it east-west. Then we turn around and we come right back and drag it again because we know that the corn gets hammered pretty good with the drag hose in the field. We always do it in the morning to try to get the maximum damage done. And you can see where this little corn stalk didn't take the drag too well, but these other guys did. So we drag it at the V1 stage, then we drag some more at V2 and some V3, V4, and V5. I stop at V5 because that's all of the corn I've got to work with. This is a video of us going in here at V4. This is what most farmers, when you talk to them, you know, they start cringing. But that's why we do research plots, isn't it? You always want to find out what's going to happen. And I would just point out that the corn on either side of this has already been flattened. And this corn was side dressed with 28, it wasn't side dressed with Bernard. But he goes through there and he flattens the corn, and the hose is a little low in water. He'll turn right around once it gets across, and he'll go back across it again. Just stand it back up, as I tell people. When you snap them off, like this one, you see how that's clearly been snapped off, and that one's clearly been snapped off. And these, see how they've congregated? You've got several together. When we break them off, and that usually starts at the V5 stage, when we break them off, we know we're gonna have more damage than we wanna have. When they're just bent over, we don't have a yield loss at this stage, but when we snap them off, we do. Now the growing point is still low enough that they will come back 
but they usually come back as two suckers with two little ears about the size of your thumb, so they really aren't much to, to look at. But if you look at our first three years of data so far, if you just look at the composite, now on the left-hand side is a corn stage. No drag hose at all. Drag hose at B1, drag at 2, drag at B3, B4, and B5. 2014's population yield, population yield in 2015, 2016's population and yield. And then corn of just a summary of the yield down the right-hand side. Just at a first glance, no drag hose, 152.5. Three years of drag hosing at the B1 stage, 155.4. Three years of drag hosing at the B2 stage, 154.8. V3, you know, as you look at it, it looks like we're gaining as we go across these things. But when we hit V4, there was our break over the four year average. We were okay through the V3 stage, but not okay to V4. But really, only one year out of three was it not okay. If you looked at our first year, at V4, we ran almost 150, and the po population was pretty similar. And we were okay on the yield. And in 2016, population started to bend lightly. Still, yield-wise, we were okay. It was only one year out of three that the V4 stage of flattening the corn bit us. Now that was a very wet spring. So when you asked the agronomists, they had two major theories on why this happened. One, perhaps the corn was further along, actually physically taller at the, at the B4 stage than normal. Or two, because we couldn't get in the field the following week to nail the B5 stage, what does corn not like when it's injured? It doesn't like cloudy weather and it doesn't like saturated feet. So the fact that it stayed overcast and wet for the next couple weeks may have hindered our, our growth or recovery of the corn. Regardless, we feel really good that we can flatten corn at this stage of growth. And I have a lot of commercial guys who text me pictures of corn each spring and ask me what I see. This first leaf, the first rounded leaf that came out of the ground is our B1 leaf. This leaf has clear collar attached, so it's gripping that corn plant. So that's V2. This leaf also has a clear collar where it's gripping that plant, so that's V3. So this corn is V3 stage corn. This is the same size as what Harrods had when we flattened their corn last year, and they ended up with 222 bushel per acre off of it. We feel really good that we can flatten corn at this height. How many weeks of a window do we have? Well, if we plan in early April, like it looks like we're getting started in Northwest Ohio, we probably have a good six week window before the corn would be too tall to uh, apply the manure directly. So we think that we've got an opportunity here. So if you're a pork producer what are you, or a dairy producer, you are talking to your commercial applicator, you are saying, when this field gets planted, we want to be thinking about getting manure on this field. The biggest holdup for most of this is getting the proper equipment. We are not yet there, but we're getting close. What we've done is, uh, like many of you probably, we have gone to the uh, oil, oil rich areas of Pennsylvania and we've purchased these frack tanks, these temporary tanks you put in corners of fields. This guy has two semi trucks that are dumping into this frack tank, and from this frack tank, he has a drag hose that's running. This is really going to be common, and we need it because we need to move manure further as we've allowed fields to get built up over the years. The other piece of equipment that's coming along that I think will really uh, help us a lot in our goal is this new bad boy that Cadman built. Even though it's ridiculously priced right now, I think this is the future of our manure application in our area of the state. And the reason I think that, this is a half mile of hard hose. This is their booster pump. This thing sets up in the end rows of the corn, has its own independent AB line. And it's slaved with the tractor and the applicator. And it's being fed by this soft hose line that's coming off that frack tank we looked in the previous picture. The way this guy works,
is that you, even though this is November and there's no corn in the field right now, this is designed to side dress corn up to the height of these tables. That would be a bigger window than what we have with our drag hooks. Now, now he's running an airway. We've got an eight tine airway on the outside row, a six tine airway, or a four tine on the inside behind the wheel. An airway is basically churn the ground and they pump the poop right on top of them. So you can see a string of, or a uh, flow of poop right behind each one of those. The reason I like this tool bar, they built this based on our university research. They think that this is a, a real strong future. And they run down the far end of the field, unrolling this hose, it's being pulled out. When they get to the far end of the hose, they simply turn and they come back and they allow that hard hose to ride in the same row as it went on the way down. The only change from our traditional system is a little bit longer stair and a wheel to hold the weight of that hose. Now they don't have it perfected. You can see a kink in the hose and a, a few other challenges they had. They were fighting their office gear on their track of that day. They went from a 12 to a 16 row applicator now. But they can deliver over 1,500 gallons a minute to, uh, to the field. And they think they can run all day long with this thing and not stop. Just continue to go right down through the field of corn. Corn does not have to be planted at a 45 degree angle like our dry coast guys. The reason we don't think this is going to be rapidly adapted <coughs> is they need $625,000 to start. Not very many of our average Joes are going to invest in something like this. They're very familiar with the dry coast. That they're familiar with, this not. But when he does get back to the other end with this toolbar, if it were working properly, which it was pretty close that day, that big reel automatically knows to move down the next 16 rows of corn or 12 rows or 8 rows or whatever. And he should be able to take it right off. Shouldn't have to pause there. But any of you who work with manure, he's sitting there still pumping 1,500 gallons a minute of manure on what? A big pile. I'm being as courteous as I can with my camera and staying back. But right here, I was sure he was going to pull that hose in half. I was going to take that right there. I thought for sure it was going to bust. But eventually, it does release and he's able to do it again. When they get this all worked out the way they want to, uh, and they're going to demo this again at the North American Mineral Expo in uh, Wisconsin this summer, just like they did in Ohio last summer, uh, they think they can run with that. So I think that there's a lot of potential here. But in the meantime, most of our guys are probably going to adopt the Drago system. And I look at that just the same as I would look at somebody going from a simple electronic record keeping system to a more complicated system down the road. Maybe my guys will outgrow uh, our Drago system and go to this, and maybe not. But what we have done is we've collected enough money to build two 12 row dry hose systems in the state of Ohio, the toolbars, and we're going to loan them out to farmers starting this year. Uh, the first dry hose arrived the other day. Essentially, this is what it looked like. These are the new Dietrich swivel applicators. You basically have a colder in the front, you're putting a manure on top to till the ground, and you are uh, covering with covering wheels behind that. We're going to loan these out to uh, commercial applicators. To the farmers, you probably need about a 300 horsepower tractor to, to run with this. This is just a back picture. You can see the covering wheels on the back. But we're going to run with these things in the state, and we're going to try to, to spread the word. If you look at 30-some years ago, our soil and waters used to lease no-till drills, conservation tillage equipment, make that available to farmers. We're just going to repeat the same strategy with, with this type of toolbar. This is kind of a better look. You've got a wavy colder in the front. You've got a boot putting manure on top of the ground that's just been tilled. And then you've got your covering wheels. We went this route because it's lower horsepower requirement than what those Dietrichs would be. And we think we can pull it a little bit better. Um, should we go to a 16 someday <coughs> to match the 16 row planters? I don't know. What we're thinking we're going to do is just with the GPS and the auto steer, we think we're just going to shank it every row all the way across the field and just do it that way. But we'll see. We'll let the farmers decide what they want to do down the road. My concern as a manure application person is this bit of data from Purdue. 
Remember I showed you those curves where we're losing all that dissolved phosphorus and in increasing amounts? Purdue has some long-term fields, and many of your other universities would too, but I like their data because it's just here. Where they plow their field every other year, the amount of phosphorus in the upper four inches of soil is very similar to the amount of phosphorus in the next four inches of soil. In Ohio, we've really gone big to chisel tillage. And what has that done with our phosphorus? It's really starting to concentrate that in the upper four inches of the soil. And in our no-till, which we do a lot of that in Ohio, what happens more to our phosphorus? We really, really concentrated that in the upper portion of the soil. All the new manure application equipment is also going to shallow application of manure. When you think of our poultry, we cover about a half million acres of uh, soil every year in Ohio with poultry litter. And the law requires it to be incorporated, so what do guys do? They disc it in. When I was in school, they said if you disc in commercial fertilizer, it'll probably go to a depth of half of what you disc. So if you go to four inches, the fertilizer will be incorporated to two inches. My theory is that in our excitement of adapting our new uh, way of side dressing corn, we're going to contribute to the uh, stratification of phosphorus in our soils in Ohio. As much as I'd like to see Lake Erie clean up, I don't think we have a prayer if this is uh, one of the biggest reasons for our phosphorus runoff. We are going to have to look at going back and plowing on occasion to make the numbers come out. I really think we'll have to. And then the last slide I'd like to throw out, and again, I do this because of all the livestock audiences I usually address. Iowa State had some pretty nice data that I've used time and time again. They put 100 pounds of P2O5, and this is 21 fields that they did to, but 100 pounds of P2O5 as commercial fertilizer they put 100 pounds of, as liquid swine manure, which would be about 4,000 gallons per acre. They put 100 pounds as poultry litter, which would be a little over a ton per acre, would be 100 pounds of P205. They put 100 pounds of beef manure, which would be about five tons per acre, and no, no phosphorus at all. And then they made it rain in the rainfall simulator, and they captured the runoff. As much crap as the manure guys take in our state, who actually loses phosphorus faster off of a field? It's your commercial fertilizer. It's designed to be soluble, it certainly is. When we do our surface application of P2O5 in the fall following soybeans, and it sets there all winter, where does it go? We know where it goes. So our biggest, our biggest hope of cleaning up our lake is going to be to incorporate our commercial fertilizer. And secondly, I think we have to get to the point where we don't uh, uh, stratify our phosphorus as much as we currently are. So I'd like maybe to go back to Dietrich sweeps, uh, but we're going to use the rotaries and the newer systems, uh, at least initially, and see what results we get. Those were my presentation. I will be happy to take questions if anybody has questions. Yes? Um, five years ago, there was another system similar to the rotating thing that you were showing. This would actually uh, drag right behind the tractor, and it would basically lay the hose. The whole thing would go over the road. It was it was on top of the. It went with it. It was called yeah. Walter Manders built that in Bowling Green, Ohio, called a crop enhancer, well, and you can still find YouTube videos on that. Yeah, it's never been continued. Um, nobody picked up the, the design and went with it. But if it hadn't been for the soil compaction issue, which is what most people saw with that, because you had all that hose, kind of looked like an ant carrying a school thread through a field. Um, that was the only draw, drawback on that. Yeah. Well, in, in Iowa, when we tried to use it, we basically found that it was just a very slow application. Mm -hmm. The procedure. But I'm interested to know if the new one that you were showing, if there's any difference. Uh, this guy here? Right. It almost looks like this also drives a little slower. Only because he was doing 9,000 gallons per acre that day. They, with the big pump here, uh, they said they were running 1,500 gallons a minute. So that's a pretty good number for most commercial manure applicators. Although 1,800 is even more desirable, or 2,000. In Iowa, when Puck talks about when they do their manure application, they have a 12-inch <coughs> hose coming to the field and they do their application with an 8-inch hose. 
In Ohio, we usually have eights come to the field to do our application with a six, although we're gonna get bigger in the years ahead. But I, I think this, because you're capturing the nitrogen, you're side dressing your corn, I can accept a little bit slower. But these guys really think that, you know, if, if they can maintain that 1,500 gallons a minute, that's a very acceptable number for our area. Yeah. But it is a lot faster than what they have, than what Walter had on his system. Yes? What was the percent solids of the swine manure and what type of soils are, or does this being applied to? Mostly clay soils. And on most of our hog manure is about 97% water, 3% solids, maybe 4% at most. Okay. Beef manure that I used in my plots ran uh, 10 to 11% solids, and I had to gear down dramatically to get the same rate on, okay. dramatically. Yes. We just think that for most, of, for most of what we're doing, we have adequate ground in Northwest Ohio to put our manure on. We just have to get to the right places. And if we can capture the you know, in those hog pits, one of the early speakers said that Iowa was crediting $5 per uh, pig for the value of the hog manure. And our double white hog buildings that hold about, or that we get about 700,000 gallons of manure out of each year, um, I could easily credit that with $4 a pig pretty quickly for the N, P, and K. But everybody needs to remember that that nitrogen is about a dollar fifty of that. And so if we put it out in the fall and give it away, uh, we're not, not benefiting from it. But if we can capture the nitrogen, replace our commercial fertilizer, then we've paid for the manure application. That's where we really want to go. We think the commercial applicators that we work with will, uh, will take this design, they'll run to their sh sheds next winter, and we'll have all <coughs> kinds of guys build their own. I can, get, I can buy these for 75000 or farmers can build their own for under fifty. And I think that a thousand acres pays for it. And where I visualize this is gonna work best, we have a lot of cousins and brothers and family members that have hog systems or, or dairy systems. Uh, you'll just see them get together at Christmas time and say, you know, if we each shared this, we'd pay the whole thing off in three years between the three of us. Why not do it? So, yes? What is the percentage of your fields that are no-till versus strip-till and then versus Conventional probably still 70%. So, and in those systems, are, is anyone doing a drag post system pre planned in your application so that they can't get it incorporated in maybe a little bit higher level? We, uh, we had a farmer hooked onto this um, in Ohio over the last two days doing pre planned application. And we, I, I don't do any research on pre planned with farmers because I've yet to meet a farmer who says, Glenn, the field's ready to go. I'll just stay out of it with my corn planter until you've had time to play with your poop. You know, there, we, we just know that we don't know whether it two hours, two days, or two weeks to plan. So we've got guys that want a better soils that know they have a little better, little more uh, generous window that are probably looking at running in here and are going to put their manure down pre-plant. Then they'll move over with their planter and they'll plant a few inches away from this strip. We have had problems where people have put high amounts of manure on the field, they disc it in, and then they plant it, and then the salt and the ammonia has interfered with germination of, of the crop. And we've had guys have to replant a field. If they wait a week, they can probably be all right, but if they do it just as quick as they can get back in, they put their seed right where they put all this salt, and it uh, has interfered with that. So. Is that all the manure types, or you find that with like more poultry litters? Or no, not so much with poultry litter, because almost all the poultry litter goes out later in the summer. But uh, mostly that's been, like the winter we just came through, we only had, I bet, been a beautiful November, so everybody got their manure hauled, which is great. But then we probably didn't have three weeks this entire winter where the fields were either frozen or fit to do any manure application. So when fields got fit this week to start, there was quite a list of farmers that really needed to move manure. So, you know, I think that uh, uh, it's neat to have equipment for them to play with to see what, what the possibilities are. I, I think because the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potash in manure is all slower releasing than what commercial fertilizer is, I think early pre-plant is a wonderful way to go. You can make it, make it in the field. <coughs> yes? Uh, going back to your dragging the holes over the fort. Yeah. Uh, think, uh, what population density is going to be using the plants per acre? Most, mostly in Ohio, we drop, uh, we plant 34,000 
uh, seeds per acre, maybe 33,000 with the idea of a 31,000 stand or so, plants per acre. And this would be in a, probably about 28,000 looking at that down through there. But yeah, I tried to take uh, stand counts and you can see we run into the, there's a 30, but mostly in the 20s, mostly in the 20s there. There we ran kind of in the 30s. So um, yeah, we try to, to get those type of, pop, type of population numbers. But, you know, it's uh, the thing about the research plots at the, at the university, um, being a field specialist, I'm always the last planted. So they've got to plant the corn specialist plots, and then they've got to plant the soybean specialist plots, and then they'll plant the lower manure guy people. So my corn generally gets planted around May the 15th. And um, if I were planted around May 1st, like most farmers, uh, this 152 average would probably be a little higher. Yeah. It's interesting to see the population count drop is not much between those three B1, B2, B3 stages. Right. Well, the growing point's still below the ground. So, but we want to do another two years of this, get a five year number so that we have something we can look at. But it does give the commercial applicators and the farmers confidence in the state of how far they can push the drag hose idea. Yep. If we gain the 16 bushel that I expect they would gain, Theoretically, there's no reason you wouldn't go, you know, flatten all the way to here. Stop, stop right at V4, and you probably would make it work. But again, we'll we'll fine tune the, the numbers as we go. We just think that it's important that we figure out whether we can do straight angled fields or straight fields. That's what I I think is our long term. I really like the balance that we get. Our NP and K all seems to work real well in this system. Um, corn stands. You just got to make sure that you have a tractor with enough front end weight if you do this. Uh, it's just not for the faint hearted. It's not the horsepower of the tractor, it's the ability to pull the stinking hose because that's got a lot of weight to it. If you've never worked with, with the drag hoses before, that's your problem. Some states don't have a lot of liquid manure, but that's, Ohio is almost everything except poultry is liquid manure. So we, we really have to address what we have to work with. So you said that your, the goal is to side dress every other year? Every other year. Do they have enough storage to only use their manure every other year? Nope. Or do they need to use it every year? Uh, they rotate fields. They'll rotate fields. Yes. Yes. So they have enough land to do that? Yeah, well, for like a double white hog building, if you follow the soil and water district, they'll tell you you have to have about 800 acres. Um, that's not actually very accurate. If you do the analysis of manure and they pull it out, if they'll have 300 acres that they can side dress like this, they'll be fine. It'll balance out. But it's, again, it's uh, book values aren't all the same as real life values. And, uh, you know, Sometimes we get a little bit sideways with soil and water on this, but once they look at the soil test and they look at the uh, manure analysis and they see how we're using it, they don't have any problem. You know, we're putting it on according to the, to the actual values of what we're using. So, low soil erosion, a lot of positives here. We just think it's a, a super way to go. And we expect, you know, we got the two toolbars. I've asked our corn growers for a third toolbar. And I've written a couple other grants, so I guess I'd like to see myself managing four or five, six toolbars uh, next year at this time, keeping, keeping them happy, keeping them in the fields, keeping the growers going. Transporting them between fields, we require everybody has to power wash the toolbar off after they use it, and they have to, to uh, bleach it. So that's how we're going to transport it. We're only going to use it with finishing facilities, no sow units, no nursery units. From a biosecurity point of view, we don't want to be the spreaders of PED virus in Ohio <coughs> or anything else. Transportation-wise, we're looking for old Donahue trailers to set these on. Um, they're the they're the trailers that you lock the wheels, you pull them forward, and they set on the ground, and then a farmer can back the tractor onto the trailer and lift this toolbar up. Uh, we think these are running around 10,000 pounds on these toolbars. Uh, this was only a seven-row unit. But that's all Herod's had at the time. They built this in their own shop, and they said that they thought they paid for it in uh, two and a half years of usage. So again, just a seven-row unit. But they're, if they're going to pull our 
11 or 12 row unit this spring. And if they can pull it, then they'll take this seven row back to the shop and they'll make it. They'll add two units to both sides of it, make it into their own, own system. Okay, any other questions or any thoughts or concerns? I have YouTube videos. I should list on the website if anybody needs them. Uh, I put all these on on uh, on a YouTube site. Uh, if you Google Ohio State V, you probably come up with it. But e my email address is arnold.2 at osu.edu. Just send me a note, and I can always throw them in a box, and you can always access them in a Dropbox or something. I don't have a drone yet. That's my goal: is get drone video of this. <laughs> I'm staying on a step ladder. That's the best I can do in a field. So, with this uh, phosphorus transport in your watershed, people migrate to cover crop anymore? Are they? Are they? Are you seeing it? I got a feeling that there's not a lot of cover crop in your area. You know, when the government pays them thirty-five bucks an acre they run with the cover crops. When the payments stop, they stop with the cover crops. We haven't really got where, some of them are pretty serious about it and love it, others are not. And, and we're, we've got a ways to go. Uh, I like cover crops, especially with manure. I mean, we need to grab that nitrogen. There's no reason to donate that to Lake Erie every year. But we, uh, guys are not big on it yet. They really aren't, so. That's somebody else's department, but I do like the idea of cover crops, absolutely, from a manure perspective. Sure. Yes? What percent coverage do you think you're getting on your manure application over the uh, the more? Yeah, I see a lot. It looks like there's quite a bit of still on the surface, I guess. Well, that, yeah, the field was a bit wet, uh, but we think we'll get pretty close to 100% with, with, if we can run in a little bit drier soils. Back when I had those sweeps, I always got great coverage because I put it deeper in the soil. The other thing we'd like to do, if we get to the point where we can do our straight rows, our next goal is to put saddle tanks on the manure application <coughs> tractor. And that way when he would turn on this end to come back, and then when he turns here to go back, when he lifts that toolbar up, we want to divert that manure into those saddle tanks. And then put her back in the ground all the way down through. We can't do it here. It works great for a while, but then eventually you get to the point where you don't have time to dump it back out. So we are, you know, again, if we can get the commercial applicators to figure out how to do it straight, then we'll come in there with a little bit more research. We'll put the saddle tanks on the tractors. Very, very common. We estimate we'd only need about 750 gallons because it only takes about 20 seconds to make that turn at 1,500 gallons a minute. 750 should hold it. But that might my goal would be that, that I could walk my kids across the field like this right after manure is done and they would not get manure on their feet. If we could get to the point where there's absolutely nothing above ground, then I'm, that's where I want to go with this thing. Yeah. So we are we're still got a little work to do, but most guys scoff at the idea of, not work, of me being concerned about the manure that's surface applied on the turn. But again, we, we always strive for an ideal situation. So I like this because we're not treating the manure. We're not doing anything special with it. We're just, it costs us about seven tenths of a penny to get this applied in the field with the drag hose. There's no more expensive to put it on corn than to do it in the fall, hardly. But I tell the commercial manure applicators, let's just say you have to charge more because the rate's a little slower and you gotta be a little more precise. Let's just say you gotta charge them another quarter of a penny per gallon, do it. They'll pay it. They're, they're, if they get a 16 bushel bounce off of this, and they don't buy a commercial fertilizer, they'll pay another quarter of a penny per gallon to do this. Plus, the other selling point I'm making, we have a lot of, live, of non livestock people that will accept manure from their livestock neighbor. Oh yeah, you can put it on every need to. Well, here, if they can have it done this <coughs> way, they won't only accept the manure. They'll be much more willing to pay for it some of the benefit they're going to get from it. That's part of this whole game of, of um, you know, who pays for manure application and stuff like that. Lots of challenges that work on there. But we do have a section of Ohio in Mercer County that has to transport their phosphorus out of the watershed. Your system that you're working on in New York or, you know, or Pennsylvania really appeals to me for that, for that reason. Any other questions? 
Thank you for your time.